So today is International Women's Day, and uh, in honor of that, I thought I'd do a video about patriarchy. Um, so I, I think it's it's important to look at some of the origins of patriarchy because societies have not uh, have not always been patriarchal. They're uh, we're not uh, they've varied in terms of their gender equality. Um, and it, it's important to understand how it kind of arose and it, it why it is getting better, but is we still have a long way to go. Um, so I mean, I th some one of the main origins is biological in that women bear children. Um, th there's also you know, the matter of upper body strength, which that, that is a factor. Uh, but the the biggest uh, the biggest difference really lies in uh, childbearing, um, and that that led to a division of labor in in hunter gatherer societies, uh, where men would go out hunting and women would uh, gather. But, but of course, they they didn't just gather; they would also set traps for animals. They they took part in you know the animal killing part as well. But um, but the point is, uh, even though there was that division of labor, women still participated in feeding the tribe. And uh, so there's a there's a fairly even distribution of workload, and um, and so uh, they both contributed, and there was a fair amount of gender equality. Uh, and then later we had we had horticulture. Uh, people started planting uh, plants and and planting crops and uh, you know herding animals, and um, and again there was a fairly even uh, distribution of labor. Women, yeah, people would use hoes to uh, um, you know, uh, to till the, the soil, they would um, you know, they would plant and and gather up the crops, and you know they would raise the animals and slaughter slaughter them. So, uh, you know that too was uh you know was a fairly equal a balance of, of work. But then you have go from horticulture to agriculture. What we have uh, principally is here is the invention of the plow. Uh, you know, to be dragged by a big um, a beast of burden, and uh, be steered by one person. Uh, and there, there are a few things. One thing it that, that tool requires a bit more upper body strength, uh, and it also also allows one person to cultivate a much larger area. But number two, it also um, carries risks, particularly um, to an unborn child. It uh, using a plow actually uh, increases the risk of a miscarriage. So uh, it was considered uh, a social prerogative for men to use the uh, to use the plow and women to stay home and uh, raise uh, and raise children and uh, be and uh, sort of take care of the domestic sphere, so to speak. Um, and this is kind of where you get this unevenness because um, now there there doesn't seem to be any unambiguously matriarchal societies. A lot of societies have different divisions of labor where women are in control of certain things, but um, they tend to range from egalitarian to patriarchal. Uh, and uh, the, the main difference seems to be in terms of women's contribution to production, uh, you know, largely to, you know, feeding the, uh, the tribe. Though, of course, uh, as societies advanced, uh, a lot of production has been things other than food. Um, but yeah, basically, the more egalitarian societies tend to share the workload workload more evenly. Uh, yeah, so there tends to be very little difference uh, between the two in terms of what they contribute to that um, to the total production. Uh, and uh, patriarchal societies tend to relegate women to purely their uh, reproductive functions, so they're simply uh, present in the domestic sphere. Uh, and so it, it's uh, no surprise then that feminism, as we know today, essentially began around the start of the Industrial Revolution. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft's book, The uh, Vindication of the Rights of Women, was published, I believe, in uh, 1792, which, you know, shortly after the American Revolution, right, right around the time that industrial, uh, the Industrial Revolution was getting started in England. And it was this time when um, women were working in factories and uh, they could do uh, math, participate in mass production just, just as well as the guy could. Um, and 
do so without risk to, the, uh, to, to an unborn child. Um, but it's because this, uh, here's the reproductive function, that women's bodies have been you know, one of the most politicized things on earth. Uh, and it's become a sort of social prerogative to regulate reproduction. Um, and it, I was kind of reminded of this during the recent uh, birth control controversy in Washington. Um, because birth control, you know, a lot of people talk about the, um, the second wave of feminism or sexual revolution beginning with the pill in the early 60s. Now, of course, this wasn't the first um, revolution in, uh, in birth control. Actually, there was, uh, birth control was a big issue back in the 1920s, for instance. Uh, I mean, Emma Goldman talked about that. There was, uh, I think it was Margaret Sanger, and uh, you know, you know, plan, I think Planned Parenthood began around that time. But, um, but yeah, I mean, basically birth control allows women to have more, more control over their reproductive functions, which allows her to determine her uh, productive contribution to, to society. Um, and so, uh, but at the same time, birth control can, has also been used to control women. Um, in certain sweatshops in the third world, they have these girls working you know, long hours in the factory, and if they have babies, that interrupts production, and so there are sweatshops where they'll make the women take birth control, or even, I've heard, I've heard there are cases of them sterilizing the girls. So, I mean, uh, and since, you know, stopping them from having kids is another thing. And, you know, we also have women's reproductive functions blamed for poverty. Uh, we have people looking at overpopulation and saying that, well, all these, all these people in the third world are poor because all these women are having too many kids, and they need to shut their legs and, you know, just shut up and, be, I mean, that is, you can see the misogyny in that, right? That's essentially you know, putting the onus of, of all the poverty in the world on, on women. It, there's this whole antinatalism thing, which I think has a lot of uh, uh, misogynistic undercurrents. Um, and so, you know, a, a while back I was kind of complaining about uh, the fact that so much feminist discussion on YouTube um, it tends to focus on sex positive versus anti porn feminism. And I was hoping for a broader discussion, but yeah, you know, I've kind of realized uh, how it really does get at the crux of what of what feminism is about. Because uh, women have uh, throughout have throughout history been reduced to their bodies and specifically their reproductive functions. Uh, you know, women's I, women's bodies have been really sexualized in a way that. And Professor Anton talked about this: how uh, you know the desexed male that men's bodies aren't seen as sexual in the way that women's bodies are, uh, and since you know women's bodies are seen as these utilitarian objects of sex, and uh, there's you know, and the need to control that has gone in both in uh, you know two different directions, both of which uh, you know sex positive and anti porn feminism are picking up on. On the one hand, there's this sort of um, possessive side, which uh, wants to hide women away and uh, control the, uh, you know, you know, control men's access to them, uh, you know, by sort of hiding them away, you know, you have in, in Afghanistan, you have women wearing burqas uh, so that other men don't gaze upon them and, uh, you know, they're, they're something to be jealously guarded. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the, ex the exploitative function of, um, you know, sex trafficking, uh, sexual slavery, things, things like that. Were, um, or, and in even, I hate, I hate to say it because I, I do, although I, I, I do consider myself sex positive, but to a certain extent, I think uh, a lot of the sort of sexualization of advertising tends to be exploitative in this way as well. Um, you know, the, there's a bar that I go to fairly often, and there's a poster of this woman in the bikini just... Uh, and it's advertising something about sports. I'm like, what does it have to do with sports? And I mean, it's it's just trying to, you know, this woman is just a banner for you. They're, they're, her her whole sexual uh, being is there as as a cheap advertisement for sports. And it, I kind of, yeah, I mean, she's she's hot. I I, I looked at it and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's attractive. But I feel so insulted by this whole notion that you're trying to use sexuality to sell something to me. Um, but, but, but I digress. Uh, you know, the point is, um, both sides, both the sort of possessive and the exploitative side, what, what neither of them 
can really allow is uh, for women's sexuality to be expressed apart from men's control. That men have to define the terms of women's sexuality. I, mean, I guess I, I shouldn't say just men because patriarchy is also enforced by women. And I think, uh, you know, one, one reason why I tend to side with sex positive feminism is because in a lot of the anti porn feminists, particularly, I see also women trying to control women's sexuality. Um, and uh, in, in terms of, you know, trying to, in terms of engaging in slut shaming and, uh, you know, degrading women who decide to go into sex work, things like that. So, um, so, it, so yeah, I mean, so patriarchy, it, like I said, it, it goes beyond just what men do to women. It's the, the norms that society sets up uh, regarding women and in, uh, in, in the relationship to men, in which men are kind of the default and women's uh, reproductive functions are defined in relation to men. So um, I guess I'll leave it there for now.